Hello, Claude fans. Welcome to virtually the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco um, for a very special event, which is Claude's 25th Hatch Day Extravaganza. Woo! Make some noise, guests. <laughs> um, we are uh, just want to take a second before we really get started. You can see Claude's not waiting for anything, but uh, we just want to say um, to everyone impacted by fires or any other scary situations, our hearts are with you. We love you, California. We love you, the rest of the world. And we're so grateful you took some time out of your day to um, celebrate this very important distraction with us. So what we have planned today um, is a really good lineup. We are going to start with a clawed feeding and not just a clawed feeding, but we also are hearing rumors of a juggling biologist or two. Um, and we will be talked through that process with our um, aquarium curator, Vicki McCloskey. Hello, Vicki. Hello. <laughs> um, it's a and party. Once it is a party. It's about mm -hmm. to really be a party. And once we finish with that section, we are going to do a reading of the new Claude book by Emma Bland Smith. Um, and Emma's going to read the book to us. And this is Claude, the true story of a white alligator. <laughs> Hi, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, after the reading, we're going to turn it over to Jennifer M. Potter, who is the illustrator of the book, and she's going to give us a Claude birthday drawing lesson. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. Um, and then once that's finished, we're going to bring everybody back, and you are welcome to ask questions, whether it's about feeding Claude or drawing Claude or writing Claude. Um, so yeah, we hope that you'll stick with us today. Um, and we will get started since the biologists are in action. So we'll say bye to Emma and Jennifer for now. We'll see you in just a little bit. And uh, Vicki, what are we um, seeing at the moment? We're seeing biologists in action. Uh, actually, this is a full feed. The biologists have gone down into the habitat. And it looks to me like no is feeding Claude. He's going to get a special birthday treat. He gets about one to two pounds of food every week. And he gets fed once a week. And I believe that today he's going to get an entire trout. An entire birthday trout. Day. An entire <laughs> birthday trout. And then if you look behind to you know, there are two other biologists that are feeding our four alligator snapping turtles. And we've had a really interesting time and a fun time since we kind of renovated our habitat and added some more land space. Now the snappers have their own little beach to go to while they're eating, which is great because they don't bother Claude when he's trying to eat. Mm -hmm. Or as much, don't bother him as much. Don't, well, yeah, don't bother him as much. Um, they, the biologists have been working um, with their behavioral enrichment session to cue the turtles to come over to that side of the island. And those, those ladies are smart. They have figured it out. It did not take that many sessions to do. And they know when that cue goes in, a ball, and it makes little chirping sounds. Um, those ladies know that they're going to go over to that side and get fed. So everybody's going to get their, normally they're fed on Wednesday, but since it's a special occasion, everybody's going to get fed for the week today. Oh, excellent. And um, we're getting some questions from folks who want to know what Jino is holding as he feeds Claude. So that's what we call a shield pole. And that's just to keep the biologist safe. For any reason, if Claude, I don't ever see this happening because he's pretty chill gator, but you never know, safety first. So um, that shield pole is just in case he would ever decide to maybe come up and out of the water onto that island, we want to have something between him and the biologist. Mm -hmm. And he just gets a little boop? He gets a little nose boop. Um, <laughs> and... That's a, that's a term. That's actually a training term that we've put into place. Oh, um, but excellent. he is actually, he, that was one of, before we kind of figured out the vocal cues for him, one of the ways we used to get him to back up if we needed was to use a shield, give him a little nose boop and the vocal cue back. And that mm -hmm. would actually back him up. Mm -hmm. um, we really don't have to do that anymore because we found our groove with him. He responds to all our vocal cues. And he pretty much, he's got it down now. So he follows, he follows our voices around the habitat and um, it's going really well. Actually. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Cool. Yeah. I mean, and to your point, no matter how chill a gator he is, he is still an alligator, which is a big, big predator. And we always want to be respectful of that. Yep. Something to be said about being an apex 
predator. Right. Um, and people, people kind of forget that Claude has legs sometimes. <laughs> uh, we see him, you know, kind of floating around in his habitat, looking for his pool float imitation. And alligators actually have two ways of moving across land. One is a bit of a slither, a back and forth slither, but they can stand up. They do have legs that they can stand up on. And we have we have footage of Claude using his legs and walking around. So a lot of times people forget that they can come up like that. So that is why we always have that shield pull down there. Yeah, it's always kind of a thrill when he when he gets up and walks because when he settles, he also I'm gonna this is gonna I'm gonna anthropomorphize terribly now, but he settles down <laughs> and he does these little kind of like gentle angel wings to place his front foot paws, yeah. front legs. And it's um, it's pretty endearing if you don't see Claude do much. But his apex predator status that you mentioned, that also kind of explains, I think you can tell us, um, another behavior that people comment on a lot, which, which is just that he's often very, very still, like to the point where people think he actually doesn't move. Um, but that's kind of part of, part of being a big predator, um, big reptilian predator too, right? Right, or an ambush predator. So mm -hmm. um, those types of predators, expend a lot of energy when they actually are going after prey. So they want to conserve that energy for when they need it. And they don't want to be out of gas when something finally rolls by that they want to eat. So, um, you know, Claude actually, he, he, he doesn't, maybe it's just because I'm there all the time. He moves around a lot more, I think, than people think. Um, mm -hmm. He lately, because he hasn't had his people TV since the building's been closed, We've been having um, our staff meetings. We'll sit in front of his habitat in the window in the mezzanine and never fails. He comes over, joins the meeting with us every time. Really? So he, it's, I know his plan for people to watch. Um, that's, and his eyesight is not very good, right? But he can still see that you're there. He, yeah, he can, he can, it's not very good. I mean, he can probably see some light. Mm -hmm. So he can probably make out shapes. But if you do watch him rolling around his habitat, you'll see he uses his little snoot there to kind of bump around. Even when we're calling him over and he knows the direction, he kind of mm -hmm. uses that to get around the island. Um, and alligators have very, very sensitive snoots. Mm -hmm. So it's natural for him to go ahead and use that because he doesn't see as well. Right. Yeah. And it looks like we are, biologists are coming out now or have come out. Looks like we're moving. So if you guys are not familiar with our habitat, there is no door. Uh, we have to climb up and down out of that ladder. Um, so I think that the I think the biologists are moving part of the ladder, and they're going to come out. I believe they have some more birthday surprises. Oh my gosh! Oh. It's a clown. <laughs> We have a clown. It's not a party without a clown. It's yeah, so and we, yeah. And like viewers, we are we are struggling with some somewhat choppy internet here, but hopefully you're still you're still with us um, in the festive spirit. I know you're still there. I can see you, but and so I as this believe the clown is coming out with some birthday treats. <laughs> Ooh, and were those be zucchinis that everyone's ooing about? I think those would be zucchini slices. Uh, the turtles enjoy them. Oh, there you go. Looks like everybody at the party got some party favors, including the turtles. And believe it or not, um, Claude is actually kind of a big fan of zucchini too. Really? He, yeah, we've watched him eat it. We throw it in for the turtles, but Claude enjoys it as well. He's huh. a very well-rounded reptilian. Um, can you remind us how much he eats again? I know you mentioned it earlier, but we had another question. It's a couple of pounds uh, per week. So he's, okay. he gets fed once a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's doing pretty well. I think um, he's gotten in better shape now that we've added some of that land space to the island. I feel mm -hmm. like he's, he's getting more steps in. We all know how we all need to get our steps in. Yeah. Um, so I think he's been getting some more steps in. So he has uh, grown quite a bit bigger than when he first came to us. So he's he's gotten a few feet longer mm -hmm. and I think about 150 pounds heavier. Oh, wow. 
No kidding. I didn't but in a that. good body positive sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he is 25 today. How old was he when he joined the academy? I think he was 12, 12 okay. and then just turned 13 that first year when we got him. Uh oh, we have singing oh, biologists now. They're singing. Oh. Yay. <laughs> and this is as you know, as funny as it is, this is also like it's good for our biologists to have a reason to be silly and celebrate because they've been working really, really hard since closure, right? It's true. Um the biologists have not ever not been working since the whole pandemic lockdown uh happened. Somebody did ask me the other day how often we were taking care of pot or or checking in on it and it's been every day um, right. you know animal health and wellness is our priority and the biologists have been coming in every single day so the animals routine have not suffered change actually some of them probably real happy that they're getting so much attention some of them a little bit miss probably miss their people tv yeah um, but hopefully we'll start having guests in the building again soon yeah oh, oh. what's happening now <laughs> i believe we are playing alligator ring toss oh and oh wow oh Isn't wow that that's amazing all right yeah we got all kinds of party things going on. you can tell the, that the biologists are having a great time it's very enriching for them as well <laughs> biologist enrichment right um, yeah. And they're working, we got a question about how they're, so they're working in, in terms of how they're working around um, COVID, they're working in small teams or pods, is that right too? Um, originally for the first few months, what we did was we split our husbandry staff in half mm -hmm. and we covered either side of the week. So we had two distinct groups so that we didn't cross over and one, you know, one half of the staff would come in the first half of the week and the other stuff. And then we, um, I think, Probably for about the last six weeks, we recombined the husbandry staff. Um, but we follow, we're, we've been following all the protocols since day one. We've been masked, we disinfected between shifts. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. And it's really amazing that the that, that group of people is caring for something like 40,000 40, live animals that we're home to. It's just incredible. Um, yeah, and if any, and as we enter our six month of closure, you know, if anyone out there is able to comfortably give and feels like giving, um, we would really welcome any kind of support um, to our Academy Relief Fund. There's a link in the um, YouTube description and a button on Facebook. But if you can't comfortably give, don't worry about it. We love having you here for programs like this, and this is the most important thing. Um, but yeah, just a general high five to those biologists again because they are really keeping us going during this, and I know it's hard work in there. Um, yeah. I'd Still like to give a shout out to all the animal husbandry people worldwide. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have just been, you know, our job is live things. And yeah. I don't know anybody who has stopped. We just can't stop. So right. we have to go and take care of those animals. And a lot of, a lot of colleagues struggling right now. Yeah. Keep, and just people, not all, the people everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Not exempt. Um, and I... I think that if people, if our biologists want to throw rings at an inflatable alligator, that they should go ahead and do that. They definitely deserve. Yes. Got to have party games. It's a party. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things we were talking about earlier is that a lot of people have this um, kind of, I can't remember what the word is for a like false memory, but they remember seeing Claude when they were very, very young. And in fact, Claude's only been with us since 2008, right? Correct. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He wasn't wasn't that guy that they <laughs> remember. Though right. he, had, he has had alligators for an extremely long time, mm -hmm. and this particular habitat was modeled off uh, the one in the old building, uh, the the pit model. Mm -hmm. I kind of wish put in a door. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, we figured it out for so um, much, Vicky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't believe they've had an, uh, an albino alligator there before Claude. Yeah. Well, I think that with the Claude feeding, um, just about wrapped up, we might, we might say goodbye to Claude for the moment and then hear from, um, 
author Emma Bland Smith, who's going to read us a story of how Claude did come to join the Academy. A little more of a oh, you've got your copy. Excellent. <laughs> I have my copy. Yay. So we can welcome Emma back to the screen. Um, but viewers, hello, Emma. But viewers, um, we are going to bring Vicky back at the end, too. So if you have any other Claude questions, just keep them coming. And we'll loop back and ask um, ask those at the end before we say goodbye. Uh, Vicky, thank you so much so far. And Emma, welcome to the screen. And we are so excited for this uh, Claude reading. All right, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I am very excited to read this new picture book that we have about Claude. Uh, the illustrator Jennifer is here as well, and she's gonna, going to do a drawing lesson, uh, a Claude drawing tutorial right after this. Um, I'm going to start with just uh, talking a little bit about my background and about how the book came to be, and then we're gonna uh, jump right into a read aloud of the book. So, uh, I grew up right here in San Francisco, just walking distance from the Academy of Sciences. Uh, this is a picture of me when I was little. I think it was my birthday because it looks like there's a birthday cake in the corner. Uh, my normal day job during regular times is a librarian at the San Francisco Public Library. Here I am doing a story time, singing and reading to little kids. I love doing that. And when I'm not being a librarian, I write children's books. I write mostly nonfiction books for kids. Um, a lot of them are about animals, as you can see, that just sort of happened. Um, and But they're, most of them are nonfiction and that requires a lot of research. So I would like to say that this is what I look like most of the time when I'm writing and researching my books. Unfortunately, it's not quite so neat and tidy as this, because in nonfiction, we have to make sure that everything in the book is true and factual and backed up by research. There is a lot of work um, behind the, the writing that goes into it. So here's what I look like a lot of the time. Not quite so glamorous. Uh, but although it is a lot of work and it's hard, it's very, very fun and rewarding. Uh, for lots of reasons, I get to go to interesting places. I get to talk to interesting people and learn about interesting people. And of course, I get to learn about really cool, interesting animals. And here is Claude, a close up in all his glory, looking just a little bit fierce on his on his heated rock right there. Um, I have, I've always liked animals. So maybe it's not quite so surprising that I write about animals a lot today. Uh, this was me back when I was nine years old with my first pet, my rabbit, Fluffy. And as it turned out, I wrote a nonfiction book about Fluffy. Uh, it was called How to Raise a Rabbit. Here it is. I found it in my old bedroom, and I remember that I sent it off to Ranger Rick magazine, probably hoping they would publish it. They didn't publish it, of course, so I guess you could call that my first rejection, but they sent it back to me with a nice note. I still like animals a lot today. This is a picture of me with my family, with our cat, Tim, and our dog, Piper. I have another dog, another picture of my dog, just because. And if you're an animal lover, if you have pets at home, you know how it is, how you love sharing pictures of your animals. Um, but there are also, there are two things that I, I have learned about Jennifer, the illustrator. Uh, and one of them has to do with dogs. Jennifer is also a dog lo lover. I've, I learned that she adores dogs. And um, I noticed in many of her, of her illustrations uh, that when Claude is curled up all adorably, he looks just like my dog Piper. Pretty amazing, right? Isn't that cute? So maybe it's uh, not a coincidence at all that both Jennifer and I ended up writing this book about Claude and really falling in love with him in the process. Uh, the other thing I learned about Jennifer is that she grew up in Florida. So between Florida and California, San Francisco, we really have Claude's whole geographical background covered. So we've got another connection right there, which is kind of fun. All right, I am going to jump right into the read aloud. So this is the book, that's the cover right there, Claude, the true story of a white alligator. And I'm gonna be following along on my book right here. Um, and 
I, I hope that you learn a lot about Claude. It turns out he has a really interesting backstory with all kinds of conflicts and exciting things that happened to him. And that is why I wrote the book. When I learned about those things, I realized that his story was sort of, it was just incredible. He really is an interesting, cool guy. And so I hope that you enjoy, enjoy learning about all those things just like I did. Here we go. In a Louisiana swamp, a baby alligator cracked out of his shell. Like his many sisters and brothers, he was about the size of a banana. Like them, he had a long tail and scaly skin. Like them, he was quite cute. But unlike his siblings, this little alligator was not green. He was white. This was an albino alligator. He was different from the other alligators, very different. And in the swamp, difference can be dangerous. He didn't blend in with his surroundings, so he couldn't hide from hungry herons or raccoons. His pink eyes didn't see well. Older, it would be hard for him to find food. And his pale skin could get badly burned in the hot southern sun. Worst of all, his differentness made the other alligators uneasy. The baby alligator was in danger. The man who ran the alligator farm was worried. This little guy needs protection, he thought. So he gave him to a special zoo in Florida that raised and cared for alligators and other animals. The zookeepers named him Claude. To protect him, they put him in a pen by himself. He was safe now, but all alone. Claude lived alone for almost 13 years until one day, biologists at a museum in far away California heard about him. They were excited. A white alligator? How different, how wonderful. They wanted Claude to come to their museum and they had the perfect place for him to live. The biologist also asked the zoo for a second alligator. Claude had been alone all his life. They hoped that in this new home, things could be different. Maybe the other alligator, Bonnie, would accept Claude. Maybe they'd even become friends. This is one of my favorite pages. I like seeing the, the map here. So Claude, who was by then eight feet long, took an almost 2,800 mile four day road trip. A professional wild animal handler drove both alligators all the way across the United States to the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. When they arrived, a crowd of museum staffers were waiting to welcome them. When the handler let Claude out of his crate, smiles and cheers spread through the audience. A special team of biologists gave both alligators a physical exam to make sure they were okay after their long trip. They were in great shape. Then the biologists moved the alligators back into their crates and lowered them into the museum's swamp habitat. The crowd watched anxiously. Would Claude like his new home? Would he and Bonnie get along? Claude explored his new swamp. It was warm, it had plants and trees and a fancy heated island. Over the next few months, Bonnie and Claude shared their swamp. They swam together, they ate together, they even shared the heated island. But Bonnie didn't like Claude. She didn't like how he bumped into things because of his bad eyesight. She didn't like how he bumped into her. So one day she bit him on the foot, hard. Poor Claude. The biologist hoisted him out of the swamp. Then they operated on him to remove his pinky toe. Claude took two weeks to recover. When he returned to the swamp, Bonnie was gone. The biologist had sent her back to Florida. Once again, Claude was all alone, or was he? In all the stress of sharing the swamp with Bonnie, Claude had hardly noticed his other swamp mates, five enormous snapping turtles. Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, Morla, and Jaws were rescue animals too. They had been saved from the illegal turtle trade 40 years before Claude arrived in San Francisco. Would they attack Claude? Would he attack them? What happens next was a surprise. They became friends. After all, they enjoyed the same things like good food. And down in the bottom there on the left, you can see the feeding just like we witnessed in real life. 
a new toy and up on the top, both of them are playing with a ball, the kind of thing that sometimes the biologists will throw in to help in, uh, with training. And bath time. So I learned that Claude gets a monthly um, high pressure wash uh, to clean the algae off of him and that he actually likes it, that it's like a massage. So I thought that was kind of funny and wanted to incorporate that into the story. And then the turtle is being cleaned by fish. Sometimes they squabbled as friends do. Once Leonardo decided to check out Claude's fancy heated island, Claude was annoyed. He sat on Leonardo, but eventually they worked it out. The turtles didn't mind that Claude was different from other alligators. They were turtles for goodness sake. For the first time in his life, Claude had buddies. Claude made other friends as well. People from all around the world came to San Francisco to meet him. A white alligator? How different, how wonderful they thought. His fans drew pictures of him and wrote him letters. They bought stuffed white alligators at the museum shop to take home and cuddle. And on his hatch day, they threw him a huge party. Here I was referring uh, to his 21st birthday party, which was a big deal at the Academy apparently. Claude was a celebrity. He was also an ambassador for science. Visitors learned about how habitat destruction is hurting wildlife. They learned about camouflage and animal behavior and the genetic code that makes each creature unique, including Claude. They learned that there are hardly any albino alligators in the whole world, probably fewer than 30. Claude was no longer alone. Now he had friends by the thousands. The lonely outcast alligator had become the most loved alligator in the world. Claude was still different, very different, but in this swamp, different was wonderful. I love this spread because we really get to see the, see the academy and feel like we're inside. That's the last um, spread of the story. At the back of the book, there is some back matter um, where you can learn uh, just more detail about the things that we touched on, like where Claude is from, why he is white, more about the snapping turtles who are really interesting animals. They don't get as much attention as Claude, but the biologists really enjoy them. More about Bonnie, who's an interesting character and how big Claude is and what he eats and that kind of thing. And then I also just wanted to call out, uh, these are called the end papers. They're both at the beginning and the end of the book. And uh, Jennifer did just such a great job on them. I just love this so much. It's so adorable. Kind of reminds me of Where's Waldo, except a really easy Where's Waldo because you can see Claude right there. Um, so that is that is the book. And I believe now that I am going to turn it over to Jennifer. Thanks for listening, everyone. Emma, thank you so much. We loved hearing that. Did you ever have Claude dreams when you were writing the book? Oh, I'm sure I did. Yes, Claude has been, yeah, in my dreams for a long time. <laughs> oh, excellent. And in all of ours, of course. Um, well, I would like to uh, welcome Jennifer to the screen. And um, a reminder for viewers, if you have questions for Emma about what it's like to write a Claude book or a kid's book, you can ask her at the end. So we'll say bye to Emma for now. We'll see you in a bit. And uh, Jennifer, are you ready to teach our audiences a festive or, or give our audiences a festive Claude drawing lesson? I am, and I'm going to be using my iPad and my Apple Pencil and a program called Procreate, which is what I used to uh, do the whole Claude book, actually. Oh, cool. Okay, get your pencils and paper out, and we're going to follow along, and we want to see your results after the lesson is over. So um, I love Claude and all of his expression, and his eyes are an important part of the expression, so I always start with the eyes. Um, so we're gonna start right here in the center of the page, but on the back to do a little half moon shape and then another little half moon shape. And then we're gonna come down, this is a snout, and the end of a snout where he gets booped. And then we're gonna do his mouth, which is nice and bumpy. And then we're gonna do half moon for his eye too, cause that makes it look like he's smiling. And it's his birthday, so I bet he is smiling. There's a little nostril. And now we're gonna jump down to his hands because it's his birthday, so I want him to hold a present. So let's see what that looks like. First, we're doing his hands. We're gonna do four zigzags on this side. 
And then we're going to do five zigzags on this side because we know about his little hand and we know about the whole situation with Bonnie because of the book. So there he is. And let's have him holding a present. So this is kind of a round present. Not completely round though. I wonder what it is. Do you guys know what kind of present Claude would be holding? I think it's something he likes a lot. So this is the wrapping paper. It's got to have a little bit of a messy wrapping paper because this is a hard, uh, it's a hard sort of shape to, to wrap. Now let's give him a little tag like this, like a triangle and a rectangle. We're going to write his name on it. C L A U D E. I had to I had to squeeze those letters in because I don't always get things to fit perfectly on the first try either. <laughs> and then we're gonna do the rest of his his head come down like that and the his chin and then his shoulder. And I'm gonna connect it with his hand like this. Same with this one. And give a few little little, little creases because he's scaly. He's got some he's got some shape to him. And then, because it's his birthday, we're gonna put him in a party hat. How about that? He looks like he is having a great, great time. Now, if you want to, you can always decorate the wrapping paper. You can decorate your party hat. Doesn't have to be circles. You could do flowers. You could do toy cars, trains, all kinds of things. Have a good old time because it is a great day. And I think that's about it. <laughs> um, that was amazing. Can I show you mine? You can tell yes. me how I did. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait. Oh, it's backwards. Oh, it looks great. <laughs> oh, it looks so good. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that was an awesome drawing lesson. Okay, if you followed along um, for that, we definitely want you to please upload, take a photo and upload um, or like post your um, drawings and we'll just have a million happy claw drawings. Mm -hmm. um, okay. This is so good, I love it. Uh, <laughs> well, we can, we can bring everybody back on screen now, uh, but Jennifer, we already got a first question from you. This one is from Pamela and she wants to know, how many times do you have to do one drawing? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a hard question. I think a lot. I've, yeah. I've drawn a lot of things a lot of times because the more I draw it, the better I'm going to be at it. Yeah, that's a good life lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and then, okay, so Vicki, we had a question. We need to truth the whole Claude and the turtles are best friends thing a little bit. Do they, do, they, do they actually get along perfectly all the time? And this question, I should say, is from... Uh, Connie, who specifically asked, are the snapping turtles mean to Claude? <laughs> uh, Connie, sometimes they are, not gonna lie. Uh, <laughs> there, it's, a, it's your typical roommate situation. Right. And sometimes everybody's fine doing their own thing. And then sometimes the turtles can be a little bit annoying to Claude and nip at them and things like that. Um, but for the most part, they, kind of keep to themselves. Mm -hmm. And but so, everybody everybody wants a snack and everybody's just a tiny bit territorial, right? Or are they? Every everyone wants a snack. Well it's interesting. I was watching them one time when we put the zucchini in for the turtles. And like I said earlier, Claude seems to like zucchini too. Mm -hmm. And I was watching a turtle and Claude both going after zucchini and I was like, I don't know how this is gonna turn out. Um, but it it actually went fine. I think um, one of the things, one of the reasons that we added more land space to Claude's habitat is because, you know, when he first came, he was a lot smaller. He could get up on that island, get away from his roommates mostly. And, um, but then as he got bigger, his tail started to hang over. And nothing more fun for a snapping turtle than to watch a little tail hanging in the water for them to go after. So, so now he can get everything out. If he wants to get away from them, he has that choice. He can just go up onto his land space and they stay in the water and everybody's doing pretty well. 
Okay, excellent. And speaking of friends, um, Rachel asked, does Claude recognize individual people's voices? I believe that he does um, because he definitely recognizes the biologist's voices. He will come when we call him. And I, I can say that I think he does recognize voices because if you think about it, when um, the academy is open, there are people over the top of his habitat all the time yelling his name. Everybody knows his name. Mm -hmm. And so there are, there are always, there's always voices up there and he, he doesn't come you know, during the day when people are yelling his name, but he knows, he even cues into the sound of us putting the ladders up. He can tell oh, when we're yeah. getting ready to come down. As soon as he hears us start to discuss the equipment to come down, he's like right over to his feed spot. Mm -hmm. And when we um, moved him into the crate to take him out when we were, we were redoing that habitat, he definitely, he trusts the biologist and he swam right into his crate for the first time. He followed Piper's voice. I believe it was Piper calling him in and he followed her voice right into that crate with really not any hesitation. It was kind of amazing to, to see that. So I'm going to say yes on that one. Yeah. And was Piper our clown today? Piper was our clown okay. today. Yeah, well, I, Piper was very Piper. integral in all of, I was just talking to her actually, I was like, that was awesome. And uh, she's very integral in planning that, that party. Excellent, well, we appreciate it. Um, and Emma, so we have a question for you from, where did this one go? Um, where did I, okay, I'm so, oh, here it is, I'm sorry. Adrian, age eight. What should I do if I have an idea for a kid's book? Oh, uh, uh, great question, Adrian. Um, you, I would recommend that you write that book. You can do both. You can be the author and the illustrator. I did a lot of that when I was little. I didn't know at the time that I wanted to be a writer, but I would make books. I would write them and illustrate them and make them as professional as I could. I really think you should. It's really, really good practice. And then the older you get, um, the more the you know the more professional your writing will get and it will be great practice for if you want to be a children's book author when you grow up excellent thank you um and jennifer this one is from lucy and she asks um have you ever made up a character oh oh all the time all the time <laughs> that's one of my favorite things to do <laughs> excellent do you yeah, have sometimes, a favorite um i have well I have a lot of favorites. Uh, I'm constantly trying to write stories too for them. So um, I don't know, I've done stuff about dogs, I've done stuff about foxes, I've done stuff about little girls and boys. Um, I don't know, everybody can be interesting, I think. Yeah, and it makes sense that if you invent a character, you have to write a story for them. They need to have, a, they need to have some history there. Um, let's see here. So Vicki from Nadia, can you share a bit about the preparation, about how, well, she says specifically the preparations involved in transporting Claude and Bonnie from Florida to California way back when? Uh, they were driven and they were in um, wooden crates, I believe, is how they were driven over. And um, they, they somebody, I think somebody just drove them nonstop. Mm -hmm. They came over. Um, luckily, as far as alligators go, like we were talking about earlier, how they they can set still for a really long time. So that's not a problem in transport when you're transporting something like that. Yeah. And now um, we have we have a crate that we designed for Claude that has windows and doors. So when he is in it, we can check and get to him if we need to. Mm -hmm. It's pretty neat. Yeah. And it makes sense, no stopping when there's a gator in the back. Um, yeah. <laughs> Emma, this one's from Sarah, and she asks, what was the most unexpected thing you learned while researching Claude? Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll give you a couple. Uh, I think the story about Bonnie was, was one of the, was very unexpected. And I, I, that was really what, um, what, what made this, uh, such so what makes Claude's story so perfect for a picture book because it really gives his story conflict which is what every book needs so what that's what when I read that I was very surprised and I was also kind of excited because I thought oh my gosh this is like a Hollywood story we have to make a book out of this 
Um, another thing that was surprising to me was how rare albino alligators are in the world. I had no idea. We decided to say that there are fewer than 30 to be safe, but there are probably quite a bit. Some people say there are far fewer than 30. So there are almost no albino alligators in the wild because they just about can't live in the wild. They get uh, snatched up and eaten uh, almost instantly. So that, that was pretty surprising to me. That stuck with me. Okay. Um, and let me see here. So Sharon had a question um, specifically about how the you and the Academy work together on the cloud story. I'll read it out. For, so from Sharon, Emma, did you first go to the Academy to get their blessing before writing your book? Could you walk us through the process of uh, moving forward with that? Yeah, it was sort of a, a long process, uh, but because these books take a long time to make. So this was probably two to three years ago that we started this. Uh, I, I didn't go to the academy right away. I first did a lot of research and kind of tried to make sure that I could actually make a viable, a decent uh, picture book manuscript out of this story. So I did a lot of writing first um, and got the manuscript in pretty good shape. And then at that point, I tentatively reached out to the Academy to say, what do you guys think? I, I, I wanna write a book about Claude. What, would you like that too? Do you think this is a good idea? Can we work together? And they were so nice and supportive, 100% supportive from the very beginning. They, and they also were involved in that, um, the biologists at the Academy approved the manuscript and then later Jennifer's illustrations at several points. And they, they fact checked it. So they were able to find mistakes and say, oh, you should really do it this way. And, um, and then they were from that from then on, really, we were kind of working as partners. It was great to work with them. Oh, excellent. Vicki, do you remember hearing that there was going to be a Claude's book for the first time or a new Claude's book? I do remember I was excited because we only have had one other animal that's had a book at the Academy. So we felt like it was, it was Claude's time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, a lot of us work um, on the manuscript. Some of the biologists that actually started working, doing a lot of work on that um, have since transitioned into other positions, but uh, everybody's super excited that it finally, finally happened. We were very excited <laughs> to see the, the book. And it's really neat that somebody would, really listen, you know, work with us to make sure that it was accurate. Um, mm -hmm. That was, that's really important to the biologist. And so we were super happy that Emma would, you know, come back. We had a dialogue running and um, nobody got, uh, you know, wiggly about this isn't quite and maybe this and that kind of thing. I mean, it was great. Excellent. Yeah, well, we're the, it's such a beautiful outcome. Um, and I, I think that what I'll do, the questions keep coming, but I think I might just end with a trio of Claude questions since it's a Claude party. Um, so Vicki, can you tell us, uh, this is from six-year-old Falcon, what kinds of things does Claude like to do? Uh, Claude likes to eat. I don't know if you noticed that there. He's very excited about his eating. He also loves to set on his heated rock, but now he, oh, that's cute. Yeah, but now he also has, <laughs> um, he, we have just um, started, this will be fun. I know we talked about how um, Claude gets his bath to keep him clean. I don't know if you guys noticed, he did get, he did get bright and shiny for his hatch day celebration. Um, the biologist made sure he looked spiffy for today got his little bath yesterday but we've also started working on tactiles with him so that means that we are hoping to be able to start um scrubbing on the head we started slightly touching him on the head and so far he appears to really like it so um i think that's one of the things he's really going to like we're, we're doing it slowly but hopefully pretty soon we'll just be able to give him little head scrubs and massages and i think he's going to really like that mm -hmm. Oh, who wouldn't, man? Um, okay, let's ask. Oh, and do we know? Um, so this is from Stella, age eight. She is curious. Do we know where Bonnie is now? I think Bonnie went. I believe she went back to Saint Augustine. Okay, back to where? Yeah. Nodding. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> um, okay, so Sophie would like to know. Um, she really wants to work with Claude too, and she asks, "How do you become a biologist?" 
um, you should probably start now <laughs> and uh, start start volunteering. A lot of people want to work with the animals, so a life science degree definitely helps. And mm -hmm. start as young as possible, getting all that hands-on experience wherever you can working with animals. So I think Sophie might not be old enough to volunteer yet. Um, yeah. So should she read some books or just learn all she can about all the animals that she likes? Read all the books. I sometimes, well, maybe not right now, but um, if you have any access to classroom animals, when we get back in the classroom, mm -hmm. finally, I know a lot them. of instructors have, um, a lot of biology professors will have um, animals. So you volunteer to take care of those when they're in your classroom. Oh, good idea. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to put Claude up here again for this last one, just because we need to see. Oh, wait, I messed it up. Christina, can you help? Thank you. Um, Christina Fong, back of house. Three cheers for our producer. Um, so Vicki, we are celebrating Claude's 25th birthday today. And lots and lots of people have asked, how long do alligators live? So he could probably live about another 25 years. Um, they go, go up to 50 years. So Claude and those snapping turtles could potentially still be there 25 years from now. That'll be interesting. That'll be an interesting part. <laughs> yeah. So we have many, many more hatch days to look forward to. Um, and we so hope that you all enjoyed this one. Thank you again for being here. And we'll say goodbye for the moment. But um, We'll share some more Claude things on our social channels today, and we'll keep trying to answer Claude questions if you want to keep asking them. Um, so with that, we'll say goodbye. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and we hope that you um, uh, treat every day like Claude Hatch Day uh, and have a fish cake and draw something <laughs> silly. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.